So good morning now as we are live streaming globally, so not just here in the center, but also throughout the whole world. People are listening attentively to Dharma. And uh, last week we had the uh, here at the BSV, the annual AGM, and we discussed the percentages of those uh, listening to Dharma worldwide, and one of the highest percentage was in America and UK, so even more than Australia, so that's quite interesting. So it shows that uh, the good work that this center is doing, and, and uh, having that conviction from or over 50 years now of uh, supporting many, uh, many well-known teachers or, or disciples of well-known teachers from uh, the forest tradition of, uh, in Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma, these main three countries. Of course, there's been other uh, Buddhist traditions as well staying here. I myself, uh, originally from training in Thailand and also in Australia, in both countries, and I've come out and uh, some business, and uh, now I'm uh, the resident monk here. My name is Ajahn Katapunyo. Yesterday, I successfully did my second one-day retreat, and, uh, and I pushed the people quite hard. And I could see very everyone was very tired, and I can see one or two people from that retreat here this morning, and I can see a bit of a smile from that statement. So uh, obviously when they went home that night, they thought, oh, that was tough. <laughs> the Ajahn really made us work. <laughs> and even myself, uh, uh, doing so much intense uh, 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 work on the, uplifting the, the laity to practice bhavana, I myself couldn't go to sleep. I had to sit for quite a long time <laughs> to, uh, to uh, get in feeling the need for rest. And so even this morning, I noticed my mind very calm and very focused, less agitation, much more unification than usual. And I was considering what has caused that to come arising, this unification of the mind. And so I considered with a calm and serene mind and looked at the qualities, what is causing that unification and stillness and composure of the mind that we all sincerely aspire to. And if we are new to Buddhism, and we're still struggling to just even maintain awareness on the breath from moment to moment without the mind going home, thinking about shopping, thinking about our partner, our work, and all kinds of worries, then it seems like impossible task. But when we continue and continue, as I can guarantee from now, being more than 14 years as a practicing uh, monastic, I can uh, guarantee that the, regardless if you are a monastic or lay devotee, as I've known many very, very good practice lay devotees who are very determined in the practice, have uh, also attained much uh, level of uh, concentration as well. So it's not just, it's only for monastics, this uh, unification of the mind. And so, considering those qualities, what were the cause for it? And that was the very quality of understanding Dhamma. Because when we understand Dhamma, the mind has a natural quality of reflective quality it reflects itself. The Lord Buddha says it's like a clear pool of water. When we come to that clear pool of water wanting to drink, there is no obstacles in it. And straight away we can see two qualities that the Lord Buddha said. The first one is when the light is the right quality, we will see the reflection of our own image in the water. And uh, that creates a feeling of uh, what we call... Uh, inner reflection of 
what we can say wisely considering our actions. We're like tape recording ourselves, our daily events with our unified mind. Was there anything I did today that was unwholesome, unbeneficial? Let me review. And then upon that review with a firm unified mind, we'll say yes, that conversation I had was not truthful. I lied. And why did I lie? And further we look into it is because of the sense of ego that I want to show off. And that creates ripples straight away. And that clarity of looking to the mind is disturbed. That unification is disturbed. And there's sorrow in the heart. And then we don't give in, we don't pay into that sorrow because when we are wisely considering ourselves, this first aspect when the mind is unified, we consider, I won't do that again. I'll improve my conduct. And doing so is like taking the cloth and washing it in the sink until the stain is removed and then hanging it up and feeling gladness that that cloth has been cleaned and it's drying out in the sun and ready to be used. And when it's used beautifully white with no stains, one feels proud in wearing it. And the other quality is the aspect is that we go to another pool of water and that pool of water also clean, unadulterated, without any, any dis disturbances in it, such as weeds or muddy water. But on this occasion, the sun is of a different direction. Um, there's a, it's a strong sun, and so therefore we won't see the reflection of ourselves in that pool of water. We will be able to see inside the water. Be able to see the fishes, able to see the gravel, able to see the reeds, every part of it, detail, pristine clear. It's like it's like glass. It's like there's no water there at all. Able to see right down to its it might be three meters of water, absolutely beautiful, clean. And we're going, wow, it's amazing what I can see. And so too when we're investigating Dharma with a unified mind and we're contemplating the quality of contentment. What is contentment? Being in the present moment, not being disturbed. And this is one aspect we can look at it. But if we study Dharma a lot, we look into it deeper and we can see what is the basis of contentment. And that is a mind that is open and generous, non-selfish, for if we are non-generous non and selfish, how can contentment arise? Because we're always grabbing for things. And this is the worldly way of behavior, grabbing and wanting things. And so with this quality, we look further into this pool of water and we see this quality of contentment. As we come here this morning, we decided that we wanted to come to listen to Dharma and also maybe do dana, offer food, requisites and support the monastics and support oneself and others doing good. So that takes effort. So we have to get up in the morning, we have to uh, get ourselves ready, organise the time and everything, which instead of sleeping in and uh, and pondering here and there and just getting involved in our usual mode of uh, seeking uh, fun and entertainment. <clears throat> and then coming here, we walk in and we see it's a beautiful clean centre. We walk through the door, the automatic door opens, we don't even have to use any effort to open the door. And we say, wow, it's like walking into heaven. <laughs> And the door opens and then we have beautifully clean where we can take off our shoes so that way we can enjoy no grubby carpet. And we come in and then if we need to go to the toilet, the toilet's immaculately clean. Or if we want a cup of tea before we come and sit, there's everything provided, tea, clean cups, everything. And we're going, who's done all this? 
where's the uh, where's the workers? Where's the toilet cleaner? Where's the uh, dishwasher? <laughs> it's amazing who done it. And then we walk to the notice board. And we notice all these information. Wow, you know all the program and so forth. And then finally, we think enough of distraction. Let's come and sit. And we sit quietly. And but if we're new to practice sitting quietly, we're alone with our own minds, and we still haven't got enough skill to bring it to calm and unification. And we're saying, oh, it doesn't work. There's no such thing as concentrated mind. I'm not deserving of it, and so forth and so forth. We undermine our own efforts and we get all negative about it. And we feel uncomfortable. But then we decide, no, I will start coming to the weekly guided meditation classes and the weekly Sunday talks and the, uh, and the monthly one-day retreats. And then a person like this grows and then goes to other places, other centers, grows in more exchange in these qualities of able to share Dharma and learn Dharma. And one sees all the beautiful value of that. And so now those who can sit quietly unified. It's because of all this good work they've done, being receptive to all the dana that's providing them this, this free service where one doesn't have to do anything, not ask anything from one. And then one realizes, wow, da dharma is truly a beautiful gift. And this dana, this quality of dana that I'm experiencing here so one can't help feeling a sense of gratitude to the Dharma and gratitude to all these places and centers, how much support they're giving us and making us feel comfortable, at ease and able to just calm down and slowly develop our practice. Lord Buddha did in the past Ask the monks to always, before talking to lay people, to start talking about dana, the benefits of doing dana. And dana is the training of the heart, the training of generosity to no sacrifice. And this sacrifice is not an easy thing to, uh, to train in because that means giving up one's uh, personal preferences, one's material gains, uh, wealth, and so forth. And these are things hard-earned, and we're afraid that we'll miss out. But why did the Lord Buddha say it's a training in generosity, a training in sacrifice? Because sacrifice, when we first begin commit doing sacrifices, we know how difficult it is. For example, with our mother and father, when they are terribly ill, and we have to go to the hospital and look after them. The incredible burden, how much we're so busy and we have to organize ourselves, organize the doctors, organize their medication, their, their traveling arrangements, everything. And we don't have any time left for ourselves or our children if we're fully grown adults. But why do we do this? Why don't we just say, oh, I couldn't be bothered because of the deep sense of gratitude that we have to our mother and father, how much they supported us. We could not even think, let, let alone entertain such thoughts, you know, just, uh, I'm going to pack my bags and move to another state. <laughs> if I, they don't, I didn't exist. That's how strong it is, that magnetic relationship. Even though it's difficult, painful, and maybe brings tears to the eyes, and we maybe never really, some of us not close to our parents, some of us are, different relationships, but there's this quality of this deep gratitude for they did give us a, a basis of support for our life as a human being. And so too, we, we can look at centers, the Buddha's teachings, the monastics, and all the other Kalyamitas, how much, if we consider how much they've supported us and helped us in a very indirect way. They haven't given me a hug, they haven't taught me how to tie my shoelaces, or uh, 
give me pocket money and things like that, which our parents do, or make sure that we have free meals provided, make sure uh, you uh, get uh, interesting activities, regular activities and so forth. But here it's more, more the indirect quality, which we norm normally take for granted because we live in a society of service provider where we come and we have the concept they're providing a service. So if I'm not happy, then I've got to, I'm a customer and I'm complaining. So customer complaint. So just showing how much in the past you never had this concept in ancient times. There always was a respect for uh, shopkeepers and things like that. And uh, even when you enter my experience in going uh, in very remote traditional places in India, when you enter a shop, they angel each other out of respect and the shop owner will put down a cup of tea for you because he'll see you going to buy his uh, merchandise and you might barter and discuss. It was all uh, as a beautiful social engagement or if you go to a restaurant, they would look after you and so forth and uh, you would uh, naturally uh, uh, see the beautiful service and uh, respect for it and uh, people behaving appropriately. But now we're living in a society where there's so much convenience. You go on the tram or a tram, you always see dirty cups, dirty coffee, thrown here, thrown there. It's quite sad. It just shows that people just have so much convenience and been trained in this attitude. They're providing me service. They have to clean up my mess. It's not me. Why should I have to do that, you know? And this quality is taking away this human quality, a considering of quality of compassion, that uh, we can also be neat and presentable and not cause, even though uh, we've paid for such service, we can also show, being a good example, that uh, we don't need to uh, exploit such things to such extremes. And that's the quality of our society, uh, the merit, you can say, of this country is very great because we have so much technology, information, conveniences that why, why, we, why we just take it for granted. We just think, you know, I deserve all that. But then when you go to a poor country, there's no social welfare and there's no conveniences. There's no public transport and you feel very, oh, it is tough, you know, really tough. And these people live in such these conditions, they value any kind of convenience they get. And then it was very easy to teach these people about dana. They really appreciated any help or support they got, and they wouldn't forget. They would have the quality of gratitude. But now you teach it to Western people, they're not interested. You talk about dana, and I've noticed that, and I've said, why is it they're not interested in dana? Because they're so spoiled. They've never learned to look after themselves. They always give it to someone else to do. So they don't care. They don't care for each other. And now society has gone so evil that people are afraid to answer the phone and give information. And why is that? Because people collect it and sell it to evil people. There's a lot of sadness happening in our modern society. And I haven't come here to complain or say that's bad and this and it's terrible and that we should go back to throwing away all our electronic gadgets and live on the earth 2,500 years ago with horse cart and ox and uh, and so forth. I'm not advocating that at all, but I'm just trying to assimilate what the Lord Buddha said. The quality of unification is to actually promote the quality of dana in your heart. If you promote it and understand the concept of it, then you can assimilate it. And assimilate it, this concept of assimilation is when you create an, an artificial environment 
such as the space stations set up and the agencies, they're setting up these non-gravity or specialised gravity fields on Earth to test space engineering machinery so forth to go out of space and testing astronauts and things like that in a total artificial environment to prepare, creating the conditions of something perfectly and then testing it and analysing it. And this is actually very similar to Dharma. I was contemplating it one night in deep, a deep sense of mindfulness that actually if we look very closely to the suttas, he's actually asking us to generate these qualities that exist in the human mind. They're not abstract concepts that we have to think about, imagine. Everything that the Lord Buddha taught says this is potentially embedded in the human mind. For example, I had a conversation with, uh, with uh, one of the chauffeurs and uh, we were uh, uh, catching a stray cat which I had to look after for a couple of months here and it was totally afraid and I was considering why is it so afraid? I, I'm not meaning any harm of feeding it but it still was afraid of me. And then we isolated it in the room and we, and the other chauffeur, I said, well, how are we going to do this? And he says, we have a saying in Nepal, if you lock a cat in a, in a, in a, in a room trying to catch it, it's going to scratch your face. <laughs> I said, thanks a lot. Now I'm too scared to catch the cat. <laughs> so meaning goodwill, I said, well, I'll, 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 I'll chant to distract its attention while you walk backwards with the blanket to throw it on the cat to catch it. I said, okay, let's try that. And it was, uh, it was uh, it, but one thing was noticeable, it was, it was a cat that was being abused, and, uh, and, uh, but it was the most expensive cat there was, which I found out in the veterinary. It was a pure breed Persian a Siamese cat, the most expensive, the most refined, elegant cat species and I noticed its behavior was very refined when it when when I was waiting for him to show up in the kitchen its behavior was, oh, was very elegant and I thought wow this is a very beautiful cat not like a normal cat it had beautiful manners its composure very elegant and so uh, when he did show up and the cat well, it was was because uh, it was used to my gentleness. It was uh, uh, not af afraid as long as I wasn't too near it. Then he, uh, he threw the blanket and he caught it. And I thought great. And then I had this big uh, washing basket which we collect our, our blankets from uh, the monk's room to wash weekly. And we put it in there, but I couldn't find the lid. And we had the blanket and it, it looked like a like a rabbit out of a hat. It just popped out. <laughs> And I'm like, oh gosh, oh no, it's, it's true, it's going to scratch us in the face. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and I went, oh no, so I straight away moved my face away. But it jumped up against the, the, the curtain at the back of the kitchen. You'll see these curtain blinds as you come into the kitchen dana area. And I was try, trying to climb the wall and then I thought, then I chanted a guitar uh, uh, on, on meta and I just mindfully said, may all the goodness catch it so we don't get scratched and may it go to the vet. Because it was also pregnant and it also had a wound, so I was really worried for it. And I caught it in mid-air. It was a perfect catch and gently put it with a blanket that had many holes. I chose a special blanket so we could breathe and put it in. And then I, uh, we went to the vet and uh, she uh, straight away assessed it, said the, the babies are okay and she's okay and she's a bit calming down. but. She's doing well and they were going to put her into a proper home. And so every morning when I open up to receive the morning done or in the evening when I lock the door, that was the two times I would feed her. And, uh, and I a little bit of sadness, she's no longer there. Because I was used to giving support to, a, to a, a, this, this poor cat that's been, it's very expensive, that's been abused from some home, been mistreated, ran away and, uh, and uh, starving, living underneath the house, too afraid to come in, cold, pregnant, with a tomcat, which one night I saw them coming, and I said, oh no, <laughs> you're, gonna, you're not going to have pure breed kittens. <laughs> and they, they, had, uh, they had breakfast together, and then he was off. That was enough for him. <laughs>
So uh, it was quite, it's quite very touching for me and uh, just quality, that's, this is a quality of dana when we open our hearts to a situation where we, we, can, we can have an effect on, uh, under other individuals or people and, uh, and uh, not ignore and just say, oh, it's not my problem, you know, uh, uh, I won't feed it, you know, it, it'll go away, and things like that, you know. And uh, if, we, if we really are concerned, you know, we'll take that effort. I thought we would have to pay a fee at the veterinarian because, you know, we're taking ownership. And I was willing to maybe discuss that with the committee. And the veterinarian said, no, no, no fee, you've done us a great service. We'll find a lovely home for it. It's a shame, it's a beautiful cat. So, uh, so these qualities of uh, these little reflections and stories helps us. And then sometimes we can even meditate on such experiences and just consider the joy that was done beautifully. Even though it was very funny the way we caught her, but there was no harm. She didn't run around. We, we, you know, she was just very poised. And I made sure she had a nice lunch for about an hour before we tried to catch her because I knew straight away she'd go to the vet. They would put her under a uh, you know, uh, heavy dose, she would be knocked out, so then they could you know, calm her down and do the checks. So she would probably go for a meal for maybe 10 hours if they knock her out. So I made sure I considered it very carefully, even catching her, and it took me a day to catch her. I had to tie a string four metres long to the back door with a chair partially open. I put the food in, which I did it for about four days in a row, so she'd get used to eating inside, and then when she went to inside, four metres away, no, actually six metres away, I had to be awake. If it was any closer, she would run out. And then I just, chop, <laughs> closed the door. She goes, what was that? <laughs> she looked at the door, what's going on? And I said, <laughs> and I pretend, oh, nothing, nothing, I'm walking, meditation. It wasn't me. <laughs> she was like, did you do that? <laughs> no, I didn't do that. It must have been the wind. <laughs> So it just shows you can have fun doing dana, you know, you can have fun and have happy memories too, you know, even though you think, oh, it's troublesome, I don't want to look after this cat. But there's a, there's, there's a relationship there, there's, there's, a, there's karma there, so one has to not ignore it. That cat was, came to be for no, not no reason. So I had to see that it's some kind of relationship. Another very famous story of the Bodhisattva, in a previous life, the Lord Buddha, he was a, he was a practicing ascetic or a monk in a remote place in a cave, and uh, and as forest monks uh, of the ancient time, even now they search secluded places, but also places that are very frightening, hair standing, and the reason was for that it was to test are they truly do have perfect metta, perfect loving kindness. So they go to those places and, and they'll be famous for lots of tigers and uh, wild beasts. And they would go there and they would just hear the tiger scream. And just if you've ever been near a tiger, uh, even going to the zoo and you see just going, oh, it's a nice, nice tiger quiet and suddenly it, it roars. You just feel like you're dropping your bowels. It's just incredible. It's so fr frightening when it roars and it you know, purrs. It's, it's incredible and it gazes at you. And that was in the olden times, in the olden zoo in Melbourne, if, when I remember, and in other zoos, you could go up to the cage. Now there's all these huge barriers. You can't go within about six metres. Because actually people used to go, cry, mommy, mommy. <laughs> they tried to even feed the tiger as well. So, uh, and... Uh, so, uh, and, uh, so monks practicing in these places, uh, they would be shivering with fear because the teachers told them to go there after done their basic training. And the teachers said, yes, you have my, my, uh, my approval to go there and to practice. And then uh, as they practice there, they see the tiger's behavior. Once, once a day, they would go hunting and they would go hunting for food and they take down a large prey such as a, a buffalo, water buffalo. If you've ever seen a, a Thai water buffalo, it's huge. You, you couldn't fit it, fit, fit it through the door, you know, it's the size of two book, those bookshelves. It's massive. And it can live on that for about two or three days. And it will maybe take some of it food to the cave, but it will just take what it needs and then go back to the cave. But if it has young cubs, it will take a large portion of it. It will drag it 
to the cave so then the young cubs can can uh, start to learn to tear meat and how to uh, eat uh, it's a very you know because they've been suckling on the mother's milk so now they're slowly starting to learn all their their training through their mother so uh, it's not like they naturally understand all these things and so Lord Buddha came to occasion to a cave like this and the mother was uh, came back from a hunt and she was badly maimed by the water buffalo because the water buffalo had these large horns and if it's a young bull how they test uh, a good quality water buffalo they get a bit of a, uh, of, a, of a tiger like a tiger foot or a tiger tail and they go to the market the rice farmer who's looking for a good quality tough water water buffalo he'll just put that to the water buffalo and if the water buffalo poos and goes and runs away. It's 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 not it's not a it's not a really strong male, but if it if it if it breathes hard and it slivers and it gets aggressive, it's oh it's very good quality. It's not afraid, so they know it's a very good quality. And they feel oh this one's fierce. <laughs> it's a very strong, good quality, and they'll use that one for breeding because I know this is top quality. This is a true you know, as they say uh, you know. Uh, the bull, the leader of the herd, as they say. This is the saying what they mean by bull, who's the leader of the herd. And so <clears throat> this tiger coming back after being harmed by one of these great leaders of the, of the herd, these water buffaloes, having an incredibly terrible wound, bleeding. And, and uh, the monk saw this and he had felt such deep compassion because this, this tiger had five cubs, five baby cubs that was still too young needing to breastfeed. It was the mother going to hunt to get enough strength to keep look after her cubs. And then just deep compassion arose in him that this cub, this, this mother won't survive, won't survive. Maybe the wound will heal, but she'll be too weak to hunt. And uh, even tigers and wild animals have very special strategies. They use their saliva, they use uh, their excrement, and the other, other natural resources to heal themselves. They're quite intelligent, actually, animals. They're quite, they're equipped. They don't need, like us, we, you know, we need first aid. They're amazing how, they, how tough they are. And so uh, Lord Buddha, needs, as being mere bodhisattva, made the vow that I will not want these five baby cubs to perish, whatever the cost. You know, I'm here secluded alone, came here for seclusion, but now I have a duty. Because he saw himself back then as someone that's developing virtuous qualities. He didn't know when he would complete his task, but as we know in the Jark of the Tales, he was very clear that from life to life that this was his task at hand, this was, was his duty. So whatever was happening in that life, what presented itself, he would take up the responsibility and the challenge and so he would then go up to the cub and uh, with a sharp flintstone slice his wrist and then allow the blood to pour onto the mother and she would feed on his blood. This is probably after maybe three or maybe almost a week. If it was any more longer, the cubs would perish. She would not be able to sustain them and no other, and as we know with old animals, no other mother will adopt those cubs. And, uh, and it's very true uh, that they will just have to perish. Wild animals have this air breed, they're not mine. I will not, they will not, you know, cannot adopt them and look after them. So it seems a bit cruel, but it's very hard to understand uh, uh, the nature of animals, the society and animal and the way they live and uh, kill or be killed in territory and things like that. So uh, having great compassion for this, uh, for this tiger, and the Lord Buddha said later in his uh, in his life as the Buddha, he said there are these few beings that uh, have receptive power for Dharma. And that is one of them is the tiger, has very very powerful samadhi, and there's many stories I can tell you of some very hair raising, spooky stories I've heard from some of the great forest monks in Thailand, and this is one just. It's a very ancient uh, story and I've been to the place, the holy site. It's very uplifting. There's a lot of energy there, a lot of compassion, very powerful, even make you want to cry. 
the great uh, great care and kindness not to another human being but to a mere animal and an animal that's ferocious as well <laughs> one that kills so it's, it just shows the beauty and and the Lord Buddha said in uh, in his existence that these five cubs were actually the five ascetics with a punch of agi but he didn't know that then so that deep desire to look after them shows that that uh, we just don't know an animal is just an animal, but we don't know what the quality of that animal has, what potential it has in future existence. So if we're really taking up the Dharma and looking at this quality that this life now that we exist, is this the only life? Or are there other lives to come? And how can we, can we actually disprove it? And there's so much evidence to show uh, karmic rebirth, such as the famous child chanting, or the classical suttas in the traditional Magadha language, the traditional Pali way, which was chanted long, long ago, and it was recorded in ancient scriptures in Sinhalese that they used to chant like that, but it was forgotten, and they recorded it. It was immaculate. He was only six years old. He could, he could chant the most complex suttas, and they were saying, how can a child like that? And fortunately, all the fame and recognition he did ordain, but he ended up getting married and going back to worldly way of life because all the fame and recognition spoiled uh, it. So it just shows how delicate Dharma is. If we get too much recognition, fame, and our ego grows, it's easily uh, to just go back to the world and lose the qualities of these assimilating, assimilating these Dharma, these, these qualities which we have to create an artificial environment to create that. So then sometimes we're using the support of uh, another, another being, such as I use with the cat. I took that upon it as a, like a, uh, a compassion practice, focusing on compassion and doing as much care and seeing how can I support this cat that's in total shock, that's been harmed, it's been cruel, how can, I make, how can I give it safety? And one of the great experiences, the gifts she gave me, was the day before I decided to catch her uh, and setting up the situation, trying to see how she would feel about it. I first day I put the food in the kitchen. She, uh, I had the door open. I was doing a bit of cleaning and getting ready for the dana and just making sure everything's all, all, all good. And then I noticed she walked into the kitchen, even though I was around nearby within a couple of meters. And I thought, oh, she trusts me now. Oh, wonderful. And then I went to have a look, and then she ran out, and she ran right past me. And I stopped and I looked at her for. And I felt so hurt. I felt, why are you running from me? I'm not going to hurt you. I felt so hurt. Why? Don't run. Don't run. I'm not meeting. I'll run. I'll run. If I knew you were going to run, I'll run. So, because another day when I first did it, I would not even use the back door. I would walk around to the front and open the front door to get to something. Create such an inconvenience for myself just so she wouldn't feel any stress. And that's the extent where quality, we're looking at our own personal quality and training of sacrifice. No, I'm happy to make that sacrifice of myself. So then others will benefit. And then she stopped. She ran and she saw, she stopped and she saw us, st st stared at me. She just gazed and gazed at me. And we were gazing at each other for about maybe two minutes. It was amazing. I said, wow. And I said, I mean, you know, what did you... She was like saying, I'm sorry, I've just got this automatic reaction. If she could speak, I'm sure she would say that. Arjun Katapil, I'm sorry, I've just been, I've been kicked around, bashed around, it's just automatic, you know. You know I know you don't mean me at home, but it's just like, you know, like the old saying, you know, like you see a young child and you raise your hand like that, straight away they go like that, they hide themselves. Because even the mere fact of raising the hand, they feel like you're going to hit them. And it's, it's been recognised that in home schools where where, uh, or, or places where a child doesn't have a proper home or orphanage or things like that, or they're being abused or whatever, even just merely raising hands, straight away they want to f retaliate. And, you know, you don't mean no harm. It's just they're used to being abused or uh, having such an awful environment. They only known is just violence and things like that. So they don't even have that. They feel they, all their human quality has been totally drained and they have no compassion because no one's ever had compassion for them. So sometimes we, we, these kind of people or these animals or these incidents where there's people very negative or that, we don't put them aside. We use them as a quality for developing good qualities of Dharma. 
And, uh, and as the Lord Buddha says, we, all our good qualities is by our actions. And so if we promote sincerity, generosity, then we'll get back this sincerity and generosity. If we really have the right frame, and we're asking ourselves, do I really have the right attitude? Am I really sincere? Do I really want to know the Dharma? Or am I just wanting a big book full of knowledge? And maybe that's not enough. Maybe I'll get another book and read more. And, uh, and then, oh, I'll think it like that. Because actually, the Buddhism is a religion of action, of karma. It's, we are asked to act. And so we have to learn to respond to every situation with whatever level of dharma that we have learnt and to, and to see, yes, it is difficult. I've got so many other things to do. On top of that, I've got now this problem. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so we really have to develop time to calm ourselves down with all the good work that we're doing in qualities of being generous, compassionate, and then giving us time to calm down so then we can gain the benefit and, and have more energy to do that kind of work because that takes to be, to have a heart of generosity, one has to have a quality of calmness and inner happiness. So really, you can't blame modern society for not being uh, receptive or interested in doing so much dana. It's because they're so busy and so stressed that the mind is not at that level. And so I myself went Bindabhat a couple of days ago because I said, no need. No one was coming for dana that day. And I called the people and I said, no need. Please don't bother anyone. No one's offered that day. I want to do my classical Bindabhat practice and just go and, and I just determine whatever I receive, I will eat that day, even if it's only just grapes. Just as developed today, I will develop totally the quality of contentment to the point, even if I have to suffer a little bit, that so be it. Because that is at my vows as a monk. I can do that, but not necessarily have to do it all the time, but can do that as assimilating the quality of what is contentment. So I went that day, which was on a Thursday, went down to Carnegie shops, and I thought, first half an hour, nothing. Oh gosh, I'm going to be not eating nothing today. <laughs> And I thought, oh no, 45 minutes or nothing. Then suddenly a lady came up and says, says, what would you like? And I says, anything will do, whatever you like. And, uh, and, uh, and, it's, and we do like that, we say it like that. Even though they ask, we're allowed to say, oh, I'd like a hamburger of a lot and, and fries <laughs> and uh, a thick shake. Oh, also a cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> But I thought, no, no, I'll do the classical Asian Bindabhat where we go Bindabhat and we're silent and we go, we go by and whatever villagers give, they just give. Whether it's sticky rice, whether it's uh, uh, a boiled frog <laughs> 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 or just a banana, you know, it's whatever. Because they're very poor, you know, they don't have any luxury. It's very poor in Asia and it's very good training in qualities of like that. And so, uh, and, uh, and then she goes, uh, and I said, but no, you must tell me what you want. And I said, oh, whatever. And then, and then I, I, I looked and I said, uh, I said, no, really, any, anything will do. And I just went back gazing and I just stopped speaking. I said, leave it up to her. And then she disappeared and she didn't come back. And I thought, oh no, I've upset her though. Maybe, <laughs> I said, all right, I won't give anything at all. <laughs> and then she came back with, bag of grapes, I think, and she put them in, in the bowl, very nice grapes, and I thought, okay, that's what I'm eating for the day, I've got to get going soon, it's getting late. And then another lady came out of the blue, and I thought, and it says, she kept on, uh, Japanese, she said, what would you like? And I said, oh, again, anything, and it says, and it says, would you like some fruit? And it says, oh, anything, bananas, I'll get you bananas, said, right, right, and I said, anything, and she, okay, she got, got me a whole bag of bananas, and then finally the other one, another lady came, and I thought, oh, I'm just going to have fruit today. She goes, oh, what would you like? She says, I'll take you to the bakery across the road. I said, no, don't bother. There's one here, you know, just because she's already mentioned it. I says, oh, what do you like? Do you like meat, vegetarian? Whatever you like. And uh, she gave me some nice pastries. And it was just perfect. I was a little bit hungry, but actually it's quite good for, to be a little bit hungry because when you're like that, you won't, you have to focus more meditation. So actually my, my meditation was much more prolonged and much more longer and sustained. 
uh, because of the quality of contentment was assimilated to its fullest. And this is the quality that we're looking at. We're looking at these, uh, these qualities of dhammas that we're reading about, and we're looking how can we assimilate them, such as loving kindness, goodwill, uh, and quality of compassion, and so forth, and uh, generosity, on and on and on. So I'm just naming it in a very uh, just freely way. So what we're trying to do with the, yesterday, also with the uh, guided meditation, was the, uh, the quality of assimilating deep concentration, which was, uh, I've been researching that and seeing, I really want, I think it's possible, because I was noticing during the weekly guided meditation that people were sitting still for an hour and a half without moving. It was very inspiring. I never saw that like, people could sit so still. And by my, my observe, observation, I could see they at least probably attaining uh, threshold of samadhi or unification or very little distraction and this is uh, really the fruits of your good work or your blessings from the past some of us come and we sit and straight away we get very peaceful some of us it's really hard work and that depends on the blessings of the past because there is such a thing as um, action and fruit so if we've done a lot of good things in the past especially the previous life wherever we may have been, then it's showing now in our this life. For example, all of you must have done a lot of good because you really are interested in Dharma. So that must mean that you must have had some affiliation with Dharma in the past and seeing it's important in your life. Even though the mind may be still struggling with it, but there's an interest. And this is what the Lord Buddha says, you're giving here and you're attentive and you're interested in and this quality of interest leads to the quality of uh, joy. Because once we're interested, we're seeing, oh, this is very nice what he's saying. It's very true. I want to do like that. And this joy makes the mind, uh, makes the body feel light and happy. And with this lightness and happiness of the body, the mind easily goes to non-distracted state. And this quality of non-distracted, we can listen even though we are paying attention to our breath, as the breath going in and out, we can still listen and it's not distracting our concentration. And so this is how it was classically taught. The Lord Buddha would talk about dana, give stories, and talk about this artificial assimilation of developing an environment where we are testing that quality. How much do we have of it? And how can we increase it? And can we recognize, does it exist in us? Another classic one was the quality of this chauffeur was saying, uh, saying, I was saying to her, you know, he was telling me as we we're about to catch the cat, says, you know, we just got to be very careful when we catch it that we have no cruel thoughts because she's had so much cruelty. We have to do it that it's extremely gentle. We don't want to just jump on her. We don't want her running around the kitchen. If that happens, I'm going to call the vet because I don't want to, to have any more psychological damage. And because of that, he said, why are you saying that, Arjun? He says, cruelty is an aspect of the mind that is untrained. Animals have it, humans have it. Whether you like or not, each individual who isn't an arahant has an aspect of cruelty in their mind embedded and it will come out in the right causes and conditions. Like, for example, if someone's really annoying or competing with us or we're jealous and suddenly we snap out with cruelty. It just shows, oh my gosh, where did that come from? I didn't know I was cruel. Oh, heaven forbid, and so forth. And then we realize, I'm, I've got to be more careful. And this is what the Lord Buddha said, we have to learn to restrain our actions and be careful. Because even though there are these positive qualities of Dhamma, there are also these negative qualities. And we have to look into these both positive and negative qualities all the time and see how domineering all the negative qualities are, such as being greedy, such as easily being annoyed and angry, such as uh, selfish behavior and so forth, uh, non-cooperative, so forth, uh, disharmony, dissension, breaking people up, gossiping, all this is, is, is running amok in our society. It's because there's no, there's no support for positive qualities because it's a competitive world. It's Lokya Dhamma, as the Lord Buddha said. 
It's the world of competi competing and seeking to survive, survive of the fittest. But I'm not saying it's completely that way, but there are also good things in our society, giving support, welfare and conveniences and so forth. But if we look very deeply at it, it is quite shallow and it's causing uh, negative aspects. So we have to, as Dharma practice, assimilate all these beautiful qualities within the society context, how we can. And so forth with the guided meditation or the one day retreat, we began with meditation on the breath and understanding the quality of, of the uh, body conditioner, this condition of the body, what is this body the basis for its vital peacefulness and at ease if it was going to attain unification of mind and that is the quality of the long and the short breath and we can see in ourselves when we're calm now sitting we have a very long and beautiful breath very calm breathing in long breathing out long and that has a quality of calming the mind down bringing the mind to calmness and serenity and then after a while the breath will change and go to a short breathing in short breathing out short and then if we maintain the quality of the breath and maintaining our awareness with the breath, we're working, we're exploring, understanding this relationship, we're starting to see as we're training and focusing on the breath and maintaining it from moment to moment, then we can see that, yes, it's affecting this body. For example, in shock therapy, when people are under shock, they'll ask them, breathe deep, take a deep breath, breathe in. Breathe out, calm down, panic people in panic, you know, just totally, uh, totally in a hysterical mode. They'll calm them down, they'll give them extra oxygen to calm them down, so forth. It just shows this quality of oxygen has a very powerful effect on affecting the body. And if the body is calm, then this is related to mind, because we are Nama Rupa, we are body and mind. We are not just body, we are body and mind. The mental faculties of, will be affected because of the body. And we can see this when people are very uh, stressed, they'll give them tranquilizers to knock them out. If they're stressed or being agitated or violent, and they're bang, they're out. God, lights have gone out and they're in a deep state of sleep where they're just breathing. It's because they've induced an effect on the body with the endorphins to shut down the system. And this is what is also happening with the first Nupassana, is shutting down the system, calming it down, calming distraction using this this artificial assimilation which the law buddha uh, talked about so it's not just merely i'm just breathing in breathing out breathing in breathing out it's actually you are learning to recognize it and the more you can know it pajanati as the law buddha says absolutely absorbed in that knowing of it then it's drawing yourself to the attention from moment to moment and then allowing to see that progression the effect that it has of calming the mind down. Because normally we're here with our body, but our mind is at home, or our mind is at work. It's not here in the body, it's other places. You're here in the hall listening to this talk, but it's with your partner, or with your mother who's in hospital, or so on, so it's not here. So we have to have this quality where the, where the body is, the mind is, and this is unification. Body and mind together, not separate maintaining together, working together. So that quality where I'm looking after the cat, body and mind together, thinking how am I going to do this? I have to do this completely, wholly with the body and mind. Organised and well organised. If I'm thinking about home and this and that, then I'll probably disturb the cat. I'm not paying attention to the quality of contentment, well, how I should be doing it, how I'm going to catch it with causing any stress or any agitation. It takes great consideration, great thought, and great contemplation. And this is what we're looking at. And then we get all the benefits when we artificially assimilate all these different aspects, whether it's the training of the mind in concentration, such as observing the breath, or training the quality of developing more contentment in our life. We're focusing on that aspect, and we're working, and we're trying to maintain that. But the problem is we haven't trained in able to concentrate the mind. So even if you're asked now to bring up an image of, a, of a, a blue dot 
uh, probably a lot of you couldn't keep it, that concentration on a blue dot. The mind would waver. And this shows that the mind is disturbed. It's obviously not here present. But if the mind was here with the body calm, non-agitated, and you asked to bring up an object like a, a yellow dot or a white dot, and you could focus on it, the mind wouldn't be distracted. And this, sadly enough, in the ancient times, people, cavemen or the ancient prehistoric times, they had much more unification of mind because their life was simple. They had simple life and thus they were very humble and content. They lived in nature and environment. Now we live in a very complex information society where we have to think, we have to assess much knowledge, and we can say it's, uh, it's the information age. We're, we're, we're overwhelmed. We don't, we don't have enough time to absorb the information, don't have enough time to read all our emails. You know, come from work home, have to spend four hours reading 100 emails every day, some people. You know, so on and on and on. So what is this telling us? That is, is telling us that the mind is going out and getting lost in all these, all these concepts of uh, things which had got nothing to do with Dharma, we could say, just mass information. Right. Therefore, it's the aspect of the mind, not the body. So who's there sitting at the computer? Just the mind, not the body. We're not even aware. So we have to really bring the mind and body together here and now. It's, we cannot go do dharma just with the body. We cannot do dharma just with the mind. It's impossible. We cannot get any benefit. So it's really we're joining, uniting these things, and the Lord Buddha said that is complete because there are these three areas, body, speech, and mind. There's bodily actions, actions done by the speech or, or you know, different ways of speaking and so forth, and mental actions, different ways how we use our mind, our intentions and so forth. So I didn't want to go into deep context about anything, but I really wanted to just uh, uh, do a, a brief uh, understanding of this concept which I've been exploring in my own practice, this artificial assimilation. Because if we do look deeply in the suttas, Lord Buddha is saying, always develop these qualities. And it seems like, how? How do we develop these qualities? But the thing is that they exist in the human mind. It's not an abstract concept. They exist. Therefore, all walks of race, all creeds of people do experience anger, do experience greed, do experience delusion. All walks of people do experience sorrow, do experience happiness do experience joy, do experience unification of the mind, single-pointed. So it's not only Aussies or Sri Lankans or Buddhists. You could be also non-Buddhists have these qualities. But the Dharma is a language of the mind, language of the universe, language of, of uh, the nature, you could say, many, many levels. As I said, Lord, one of the translations was is that the Dharma is an internal law. It's the law of the universe. It's an abiding law. And one of those abiding laws is, is uh, uh, karma vipaka. There's action and there's fruit. And, that if we, and the Lord Buddha says that if, uh, if the action is done uh, demeritorious, then it will produce uh, 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 much, much sorrow, much pain for the person. But if the action is done well, positive, good karma, it produces much happiness, joy and benefit in the future. And finally, the Lord Buddha gave these three areas of training for lay people and three areas for monastics. And the three areas for lay people was, was Dhanamai, Silamai and uh, Bhavanamai. And for the monastics it was uh, um, sila Sikha, Chitta Sikha and Panya Sikha. So we can see the relationship is different because it, its quality for lay people is developing a basis of meritorious deeds, developing good actions, positive actions to support their livelihood in their lives, which are very busy with family, responsibilities and duties to support all that. So then they have a basis of a happy existence in the, the, in the worldly society, where for monastics, they've renounced all that. 
So that's no longer necessary. They've gone to another level. And that is the training in sila, which is the refinement of sila, which the lay people already keep, but are even much more refiner. The training of the mind, which is developing the mind even to a higher level of unification, which even lay people can experience. And the training of wisdom, panya, which is to discern and break through and have direct knowledge of this dharma, that it is not just a concept, but it actually is yana dasana. Actually, as it is, in the present moment, we just still cannot see that. <laughs>